to get rolling. We're about two minutes early, but I figure I might as well get started. Um, my name is Martin Moran. I teach uh, history, and I'm the director of education technology at the Francis Parker School in Chicago. And there are a lot of people here. Wow, so many more people to disappoint. I love this. Um, I'm lowering expectations early, just so you guys know. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, professional development in a one-to-one -one environment. But before I do so, I kind of want to get a feel for the room so I know where to, uh, where to kind of pitch some ideas here. Uh, how many people here are uh, classroom teachers? Okay. How many are instructional coaches, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. And anybody in, in terms of uh, admin level responsible for those types of things? Okay. So basically total equal. So, so I'm just going to try to swing all fields here. Um, so um, I, let me give you a little background before I get rolling here. Um, my school is in the fourth year of a one-to-one -one program in our middle school. Uh, we're in the second year of what's, what is a two-to-one program in our high school. Um, and we are in the negative two year in our elementary school of rolling out iPads year by year. So we're still in the midst of sort of getting us to a one-to-one -one moment uh, where I think we're at, I guess, one to two right now and next year will be one-to-one. -one. Um, so uh, we're, we're kind of at different spots. Uh, we're a K through 12 school, so we're at different spots along the way. And part of, um, part of the reason we're at different spots was actually a very um, deliberate decision on our part, and I'll get into that a little bit later as to why that is and why those decisions need to be made. So, um, so how many people here are in schools that are one-to-one? -one? Okay, if you, and how many of you guys are just in debt places with dedicated carts and stuff like that? Okay, so um, realistically, this, this is called a one-to-one -one, uh, program, but it's really, it's about anybody who's in a, in a, in a professional development program in which you might be using technology at some point. So I would assume that that includes everybody. Um, just because the ubiquity of the stuff. I'm <laughs> looking down at my iPad, iPhone, and MacBook sitting in front of me and thinking, oh boy. Um, so uh, so these are, the ideas are going to apply across the board, regardless of whether you're in a one-to-one -one school or if you're, if you're in a school that's not one-to-one -one or if you're, using, um, if you're using carts or whatever. Um, and, and hopefully I'm going to kind of walk you through a little bit of our process that we did starting about two years ago where we started actually getting behind this stuff. Um, to the point where we are now. Um, it's still a work in progress, so by no means do I consider, my, to consider us to be, have any expertise uh, relative to anybody else. So um, feel free to ask questions, feel free to throw out ideas. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear um, from people. If you are a, um, if you are a tweeting folk, then um, there will be anything that I'm saying here will be linked out uh, as I'm talking. Uh, hopefully I've got it timed right. Um, but it's going to be coming out across the next 45 minutes or so. The presentation in its entirety with some presenter notes, including some links and some narrative stuff, will be available at the very end. So you can get all this stuff. Um, the, the slides themselves aren't going to say much individually, but when you, when you actually get the link to the deck, you'll see a, a big set of notes that will sort of explain in paragraph form what I was saying there. So rather than bore you with a bunch of text, I thought I'd come up with really cool pictures and, uh, and, then, use text a and then use some text afterwards. So I guess I'm going to start with why. Uh, and, and this is where uh, this is where I think it's essential to start. How many people, has anybody here heard of Simon Sinek? S Simon Sinek is a guy who did a TED Talk, and his TED Talk is talking about, it's meant for businesses, but it's about starting with why. And his, his argument is that most, and I'm going to transform his argument to schools, most schools know what they do, most schools know how they do it, but very rarely do they get a chance to actually talk about why they do what they do. And, and the argument that he makes, which I find quite compelling, is that if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, then this stuff is just going to be sort of filling in gaps, and you're going to get a lot of disillusioned people in your staff. Um, that that people, are, people who are just doing what they're doing and trying to figure out how to get it done, they're not going to buy in, and you're going to have a lot more difficult time trying to figure out how to get these people on board. Uh, so the idea is... Before you ever start a program like this, and for most of us, we're probably a little bit late on this, is that you have to start by having these types of conversations. Why are we doing this? And, and this is the opportunity for schools to set their agenda on a pedagogical level. The problem is, and this is something that I see over and over again, is that tech programs are all about nouns and not about verbs. And, and 
this is the opportunity to change the conversation from a series of nouns, laptops, desktops, iPads, to verbs, teaching and learning. And, and, and if you don't start with the why, you're going to get a lot of people who are saying, well, this is just a bunch of fancy equipment. I don't care about this. It doesn't help me teach. I can do with all this stuff with pen and pencil. And, and so, so step one is to really sit down, and this is one thing that we did um, when we started this program, we, we organized a committee of teachers across the K through 12 levels to sit down and talk about not just our, not just technology, but our, the mission statement of our school and how a technology program might fit in to that mission statement. Now, we're, we're lucky in that um, we, are, we are what's known as a progressive school, a very Dewey-based, um, uh, John Dewey-based school, and, and so much of what Dewey said matches up perfectly with all the sort of new, the new concepts of technology. Technology is all about authentic experience and participation in the world and all these things. And that was what Dewey was saying 100 years ago. It just took us 100 years to catch up with the tech. So, so, so it worked really well for us to say, well, if we look at this, it actually makes a lot of sense for our school because our school is, is very much on these, these sort of learn by doing models. And before, you know, up until maybe 10 years ago, learn by doing meant learn by doing almost exactly what you would do, but it still has to be differentiated because you're only within this classroom. And now that's totally changed. So now we can actually fully realize these ideas of Dewey. And this is actually one of the reasons, my very first talk that I ever gave on technology was how I love technology because it's insidious. Um, it totally undermines standard, standards and testing because it, it promotes the authentic experiences and then all the people who are, you know, all the politicians love technology because it sounds cool and looks cool and you can see kids doing this. You have wonderful pictures of two kids doing this. Why are pictures? Pictures are always people pointing at things. Um, but politicians love that, but at the same time, all of that experience completely undermines the standardization of like, academia and the standardization of testing. It sort of, un it, it's, it promotes constructivist learning, which by its very nature isn't rote. And so, so what I think most schools can realize here is that there's a real opportunity here. If you master this stuff and do it well, you'll serve the political master, so to speak, while at the same time doing what you want to do, which is kind of how I've always taught, you know, make it look good and then do what I want to do anyway. Um, so so that's, the, that's, that's it. But I think that's where the why comes in. But if you don't have that conversation, you'll have a lot of people who are going to assume this is a, just another top-down initiative. And so, so before anything, this is a, this is a human conversation. And, and so technology in the classroom, first and foremost, is a human conversation. Because if it's not, you're going to have a, a hard time getting buy-in from some great teachers who just need to see it from a different angle. So that, that brings into what are, what are your themes? And, and I'm, I'm going to say that there are really two 21st century themes that transnavigate all fields. And, and those two that I would uh, I'd say are, are most prevalent are adaptability and agility. The ability to change and the ability to change quickly. And I think more than anything in the last couple, and especially in the last two to three years, we've seen the, the ability to make adjustments to what you're doing and have spaces, both real and virtual, that can do that, make a school so much better able to serve the needs of kids. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not the program you create. It's the adjustments you make when the program doesn't go perfectly. And, and, and what, <coughs> what, I've, what I've done is, is, as I've looked at this, is I've seen that you know, ultimately, and I'll talk about this in a second, that, that you can have all the best technology. You can have, you can have your $1,500 MacBooks and your $500, $600 iPads, all of, your, all of your stuff. But if you don't have a program that allows kids to make mistakes and explore and then adapt to that, then you've just got really expensive pencils. And, and, and that's going to do nobody any good. And so... so the, the picture that I've got here is actually a picture of, of my classroom during a free period. Um, and, and, I've, and you'll notice there's a little bit of technology in the room, but there's not a lot. 
there's a projector. The kids have their own, that, that's their own laptops that they're using. And there's a, there's a 10 year old screen back here that we found in the garbage that I thought was awesome. So I decided to use it. It's really big and the kids thought it was awesome. I'm like, you have no idea where that's from. Um, so, um, so, but the key is, you know, in, in this space, the idea is that all these tables have, have wheels on them. All the chairs have wheels on them. The most important thing about my room is not the tech in it. It's the stuff that can be moved around in it. And so, so and I'll, I'll say right now, my favorite part of my room has nothing to do with technology. It's the fact that this wall is writable. I threw some idea paint on it. That's like my favorite technology is the fact that they can write on the walls. And they love that too. So it's, it's like, it's stuff like that. It's not about, you know, I hate, you know, it's not about the technology going back to the why. It's about the pedagogy. I mean, that's ultimately what we're talking about. And as long as you have adaptable, agile pedagogy, the key is setting yourself up for not just the next, you know, the next, you know, the next iteration of iPad, but it's what happens when something comes out that's better, and how do you adapt to that, and how are, how do you how do you how do you adapt to that quickly and easily? And, and teachers do that a lot. We do that all the time. It's so funny. We do this so, so often during the middle of a class. You'll hear a kid say something, and say, okay, we're going to go there for a second. But then when you step back and you talk programmatically, it becomes a lot harder to be that way because you're, you're so used to the sort of, I've planned my lesson, I've planned my unit, I've planned these things. And, and so that level of adaptability is difficult. So it's hard to get to that point. So, so that's, what, um, that's, what, uh, that's where we're starting from. So, so the key is to first identify your why, then identify your themes. And I, I, I like these themes because they're big enough that they can encompass things other than technology. So, then there is what I would say, you know, I, like I said, we had a one-to-one a, a -one iPad program, and, and I can give you the, the very first primary, the first rule of an iPad program. Do not talk about iPads. That is rule number one. And, and this can be Chromebook, this can be MacBook, this can be anything. Do not talk about the technology. Do not talk about the hardware. When you start talking about the hardware, people glaze over. And, and they think it's all about the hardware. And so, so our first rule of, of our one-to-one -one professional development program is that we never, ever talk about the devices themselves. We have to talk about, because, you know, like to use the pencil analogy, we don't have meetings about pencils. We don't have meetings about notebooks. And so we shouldn't have meetings about iPads. We should find ways to infuse them into what we're already doing in a way that helps students learn. Now, I'm not, I'm not completely ignorant of this. I understand that, that under a certain, in, in certain circumstances, you're gonna need training and those things that have to happen for people who, who feel like they, you know, they, don't, they can't even start. But at the same time, once it starts to get about the teaching and learning, it should always be about the teaching and learning. Because that's the language everybody in the room speaks. The minute you start talking about iPads and apps, you've immediately cut off that part of the room that doesn't know those things. And what people will do when they, when they, think, when they do that is they, it just reinforces that they are not tech people and they are somehow not in it. They are, they are the exterior and they have shut you out. And so, so ultimately, every, this goes back to always about verbs. Everything is verbs and there are no nouns in the conversation. And so that's, that's essential. So any PD program, builds from that, that point. So we then need to, to think about, okay, so what are then the core tenets of, of, a, of a good PD program? And I, I broke it in, everybody gets an acronym, so I made one up. Um, AMP is the one I put together. Um, I, acronyms are fine. But basically it breaks down to four steps. Assess the needs of the faculty, meet them where they are, promote curiosity, curiosity and risk taking, and provide constant support. And I'm going to go through each one of these because every one of these is a different stage. Because ultimately, if you don't, if you don't hit on some of these, you're going to lose people along the way. And you know, everybody needs an acronym, like I just said. Uh, so I figured I might, might as well have one. So these would be really the, the four steps, I would say. So, so assessing. Where, where do we assess, assess the teachers and, or assess where they're at? And this is, this is what, um, what I would say, is that when you're, assessing, when you're assessing your teachers, 
It's, it's about getting into classrooms. You have to see what people do. The, problem, the, the other problem that you see with a lot of PD programs is that they try to be a one-size-fits-all solution. And what works for the teacher who lectures each day but is a phenomenal leader of lecture discussion may not work for the person who's always got kids in groups. And, and you know, obviously there's, there's levels in between. But the point being is that if you, don't, if you don't sit with these teachers, it's really hard to get a sense of what their individual needs are. And, and I'll tell you, coming from a, I was a guy who I taught history for 10, not quite 10 years, uh, before I moved over to this position. And I got a reputation as the tech guy, the guy who uses technology and is doing all these things. And, and everybody's got those in the building. You know, some of you are probably that person. Um, and, and because of that, I felt like I was always kind of apologizing for things that I did, technologically speaking, that, that just didn't, that people were like, well, that's just one of your things. And, and, and so, so when I became, when I got into this position, my biggest fear was I was gonna walk into a, to a meeting or to a, to a PD session, and people were gonna immediately say, well, this is just the guy who always does this stuff, and he's gonna speak over my head, and it's gonna be, you know, I'm just gonna see if I can get out of here by five o'clock. And, and so the key was I, I went into every single classroom, I sat in every classroom, and I watched every teacher teach. And in doing so, it wasn't evaluative, it wasn't meant to be, it wasn't meant to, to do that, but it was meant to get them comfortable with us having a conversation about their teaching. Because everybody likes to talk about their teaching. Everybody loves to talk about what they're doing and what they're trying. So it was about, I sat in the room, maybe even half a period, but then spent 15 or 20 minutes afterwards talking with them about what they did. And I didn't offer anything. I didn't want to offer, because the, I did not want to imply that what I, my suggestion would improve anything that they're doing. I just wanted to hear what they did. Because the idea, the, the idea behind that is, if you don't get to know all these people and what they think is important to them, when you then try to give them something, they're going to assume that you don't know what they are. And so, so that assessment, well, I was assessing, and I, and I use assess, assessing in, in the least uh, pejorative way possible, uh, is that assessing means I'm sort of getting a sense of what's going on in the building. Because it's, it's something that if you don't do that, you're, you're going you're gonna to lose people on the back end because they're going to assume that, um, that you, you, you don't hear them. And so, so that part is, is key. And, and that's something that it took a little while to do. It was something that, um, that took you know, almost a full year to get to everybody um, over the course of that time. But I'll tell you, it was probably the most valuable thing because I now get, now that someone has seen, I've seen them teach and talked about their, their individual teaching, they'll contact me, they'll send me an email, they'll ask questions about stuff because I'm not the guy who's just gonna come in and tell them what to do. I'm the guy who's sort of a sounding board for them. And so, so the idea behind that is, 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 to, come, is to go for that. The next, the next big step after you assess Martin? is to skip us. okay, is Martin? to, you had a question. Oh, question, yeah. I'm sorry, um, are you doing this simultaneously with a rollout or before a rollout? We were doing, well, it was, it was, part of it was before, but due to buying and budgetary needs, part of it had to be after. So, so ultimately, this, this encompassed, like, encom uh, encompassed like two semesters worth of work, one semester before the big rollout and one semester <laughs> after it had already started. And it was the nature of the, the, the buying cycle that we had to do it that way. Ultimately, the perfect world is before you start it, you can do this. Um, but realistically, you can implement this. this. There's nothing about this that you couldn't do even after you started something. It's, you know, some, you just have to backtrack and there just, it gets to be a little bit more of um, mending fences in some cases. But, but that's why the earlier is the better, but you can do it as things are going on. And, uh, we had, I did it, and I'll say this, I'll, I did it the year, the semester before and the semester after the big rollout had started, but we had already done it in, we had already rolled out in two different grades before that, <laughs> before I even had the job that I have now, and, um, and the only conversation about iPads during that time was how much of a classroom management distraction they were. And, and so, so I had to walk that back. I had to walk that conversation back a little bit. And that, so that's probably going to be something, if you've already started something, um, it's, you're going to have to walk those types of conversations back because 
the, the first group of teachers who gets this in the room, there's going to be a, there's going to be that reaction at first. And that was just sort of the way it was. All right, this, the, the second one, um, the second step here is meeting them where they are. And this um, a woman on, on, on Twitter and I were talking about this the other day, Kat Flippin, who's, um, who's a, uh, she teaches out in Atlanta, awesome. If you're inter interested in like gamification, she's the person to talk to, amazing. But we were talking about this the other day, uh, the hype cycle. And this is, this is what we call the hype cycle. And this is not something, this is, this is for any sort of technology that there is, and it doesn't always just apply to education. But, but what you, you can probably see this in your own schools. There's, there's this, you know, the, the new thing gets introduced, everybody thinks, oh, here's all the cool stuff that it could do. Look at all the things that I could do. Then reality sets in. And even though the reality is probably somewhere here, People start to say, oh my god, this is the worst thing. We, this was the biggest mistake we could have made. Why did we do this? This doesn't work. And then you have to fight through this, learn a little bit more, and eventually it gets to this point where you start to actually use it for productive purposes. So my first suggestion is that for, for um, if, you're in, if, you, if you feel like your school is in this point here, it, it will be. Every school will be here at some point. The key is how do you work through that point. And, and how you work through that point will help you get to this, to this here. And, and like, it, it, and you, it, sometimes this happens, what's funny is sometimes this happens in the course of like a single conversation. Like, like the, the, the time I introduced Google Docs, and, and I was like, oh, there's this, you know, Google Docs, pretty cool, you can, you know, you can do these, these collaborative things. Um, that you can that you can do with it, you know, it works a lot better than Word. And somebody gets really excited, and then and then they say, well, well, does it does it do this thing that Word does? I'm like, well, no, it doesn't quite do that. It's like, oh, why am I even bothered? And, and, and then they have to like, well, no, wait, there there is other things you can do with this that are really cool. And and, and once you get through that, then they're like, oh, okay, and then they start using it a little bit. And now, for example, every in our school, the minute anybody assigns anything, the kids are like, should we open a Google Doc? And, and I'm like, okay, go, go ahead. And so it's, this is something that happens both in the macro and the micro. And, and it's, it's always funny when, when people want to, you know, the questions that people ask about some of, the, some of the technology, like immediately, I don't know if you guys have seen um, Louis C.K.'s uh, little bit on everything's awesome and everybody's unhappy. Um, it, it's, it's really that, like, you're, you're, he's talking about a guy who's flying uh, in an airplane next to him and the Wi-Fi goes out, and he, and he gets super mad and starts yelling at the, at the stewardess, and Louis C.K.'s like, you're flying in the air! <laughs> and that message is going to space and coming back down. And he's like, and so he's like, how are you upset about this? And so, and that's, that's where sometimes, like, people get here, and they think, wow, we've solved every problem in the world. And then the reality is not, not quite. And so, so this is, I would argue that meeting the teachers where they are is a difficult task. Because you've got those teachers who just are, are here somewhere and just have no interest. And I'd actually argue that they're a little bit easier to, to work with than teachers who are kind of like here. You know, the ones who are really good at PowerPoint. And, 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 and that makes them technologically savvy. And, 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 and so like here, it's a lot of, it's a lot of training. It's, it's a lot of, let me explain, you know, and, and these people tend to be really open. It's when they get here, it's like, oh no, I, I get technology, I do it. And, and, and then you say, well, then you introduce your, you know, your Google presentation or whatever it is. Then they get up here and they're like, wow, this was just a waste of time. I should have just stuck with my PowerPoint. And, and so, so the key is, how do, you, how do you meet with, with teachers where they are? And the way we've done this is uh, we've created small group cohorts in, in schools, in our, in our school specifically. And, and this, is, this is where the teacher side of me comes out. We have differentiated instruction. And, and so what we've done is, and after the assessment period, I was able to sort of get a sense of, okay, who was our least tech savvy person in the building? Okay, the person for whom the chalkboard is a little too techy for them. Um, to who's the person who is, you know, who is simultaneously, you know, you know, using, you know, they've got a Google Hangout going on this wall and they're tweeting over here and all that. Who, like, what's the scale? Okay, and then basically we just order them one through I don't know however many faculty members we had, and we created what are called zones of proximity. And, and basically what we did was we said, okay, 
We don't want that person here to be in the same room with this person over here talking tech. Because this person will be annoyed and bored, and this person will be annoyed and angry. And so, so, so where do you bring those together? So what we did is we, we grouped them in groups of five or six and said, okay, you're going to have this cohort here, and no one in this room is going to be that much more technologically inclined than you are. And then the next group, and then the next group, and then the next group. And the idea would be that they would all have the opportunity to learn and teach from someone else. And so the, the key is, the minute, you, the minute you get a teacher, you give a teacher the opportunity to teach somebody else something, that's when you've reeled them in. Because that is, okay, I've got competence. I can teach this. There's my wheelhouse. Now I can work with this. And so, so those zones of proximity were, were, were particularly important. Now, I've worked with, uh, and basically what I, I'm sort of in the, and I'll say I'm in the process of doing this right now with different groups. Um, I've got a couple different groups going right now. And these are also a bit of a slog at times, too, because, because those, you know, the people at the, the top end want to try new stuff. But they're, you know, they, they still feel a little bit left, left behind with some people. But, but overall, what I'm finding is that compared to when we did, like, I tried to do it originally where I would do training sessions. I would do tech training sessions. And those were a disaster. Like, because I had several people just get up and leave. Because they were like, this person's asking so many people are like, what's this button on the iPad? And then this other guy's like, I'm out. I'm done. Um, and so, uh, so it's like, I, I, I realized really quickly, that was my first idea. That was like my first initiative. I'm like, crap, I suck at this job. Um, and so that was the first thing I did. That didn't go well. So then it was like, okay, let's back this up. And then I started working with smaller groups of teachers who, who all have relatively similar levels of experience and comfort with this stuff. And so, so that's, where, that's where you can kind of work through some of these things together because they can start talking through these moments. This, when you get into this disillusionment phase, they can talk their way through this stuff. And, and that's, um, that's key because the minute they start teaching each other is the minute you actually start to see things go places. And that's, that's, a, that's a key to it. Any questions at this point? Good to know. All right. I can't believe I'm hitting it off. All right. The last, the next thing. This is getting tweeted out, but if you're a if you're a QR code folk, there's a thing for this. There's a post on this. This is called promoting. You got to promote tech usage. <coughs> and what I mean by that is not promoting tech usage by me, tech guy, telling you about all the wonderful things that my that my class does and all the reasons why you're a terrible teacher because you can't do these things. It's not that. It's about getting teachers to. Once they've started to teach each other in small groups, you bring that out to a big group. And this is, this is what we, this, we ended up doing a workshop day last, um, last spring um, that was built around the EdCamp model. How many people have heard of the EdCamp model? EdCamp is, EdCamp is, a, um, is, a, is what's called an unconference. It's, a, uh, it's an informal conference in which people come and sign up for wherever they want to go to. There really aren't, um, there aren't sessions that per se, it's, it's, more, it's meant to be more informal gathering of people who are talking about issues. Now there's, there's sometimes a leader, sometimes not. But what we, we, we had to formalize it a little bit because that model itself is a little bit new to people. You don't want to add too many new different things to a, to a single PD, PD day because you'll give people just too much to do. And so we, Ended up, what we did is we, we had our teachers, we asked a bunch of teachers who were doing interesting stuff in their classes, show us something that you, that you're, that you like to do. You can run a session. Run a session in which you talk about something that you're interested in. And so we had teachers, all from the most techie to the least techie, talking about their, their stuff. And the, and the faculty themselves, what we did is we basically said, okay, get here at 8, have some breakfast, 8.30 or so, we'll start our first session. We'll do an hour. And you'll go into a classroom and you'll do a little workshop with one of your colleagues, not somebody coming in from the outside, um, because that's nothing teachers hate more than some person coming in from the outside and telling them all these things they need to know. Um, my favorite one was the one that we had in which the woman spent 45 minutes and 43 slides telling us why PowerPoint was a bad thing. Like, <laughs> irony! Um, so, um, but the, the, 
the key to this, though, is to have the teachers talk to each other about these things. So we had, we had, we had our, um, media liter our media people talk about how he does videos. We had a, a history teacher who did this really cool YouTube project, showing a little bit about his YouTube project, and, and give some time for questions. So those would run from 8 to 9, 8.30 to 9.30 or so. And then for the next hour after that, it was free time. It was play time. So we, we, we made a part of our building. We brought a bunch of comfy chairs in and some tables and things, some things like that and said, between those sessions, you are not required to do anything other than hang out and talk about what you learn. And, and aside from free food, nothing teachers want more than is to talk about, talk about these things with their colleagues. And so the teachers would sit in chairs, and some were, you know, just talking about whatever, and some were talking about, um, some were talking about the actual things they were doing. Some people were sticking around in the rooms and really trying to like work something out and try to figure out how to how to do this. Um, and so this became we had, you know, we ended up having three hour long sessions and three hour long times in between. We did a little raffle where we uh, we, we if you went to a session you got a you got a raffle ticket, and at the end of the day we we auctioned off some things that we had that were leftovers on Bluetooth keyboards and stuff like that. And it got people you know, excited to be there. Little, little things that you can do about that. But the idea was that this is meant to promote tech in the classroom usage as a, as, like I said, as a verb, not a noun. It wasn't, it wasn't me telling you how to work your computer. It was somebody telling you about this cool video project they did with ninth graders. And, and that was a language everybody spoke. And so, in one way, we promoted, we promoted technology in the classroom, but more importantly, we promoted a sense of community around teaching and learning that we could build that in, into later. I will say, the biggest mistake I think we made about this was not diving more into the cohorts right afterwards to start finding, to start, start really coming up with ways to, to take what we learned and use it in the classroom. My advice to you is if you decide to do something like this, set up time afterwards for people to, you know, even if that means, hey, take one thing you learn and try to work it into your classroom and then tell us about it. Because we didn't do that and that was probably our biggest mistake. A lot of people said, I loved it, it was such a great day, and then I went home and I had to get ready for the next day and I forgot about it. And, and so my, my piece of advice would be these, I, I thought this workshop day, and we still, get, we still get compliments on this workshop day as being one of the more valuable ones that, that teachers have had. I just wish we would have made it a little bit more actionable on the, on the back end. And that's, I would say, this, this provides a freedom though to teachers that, you know, a lot of us here, and I'm, I'm one of these people who I hear workshop day and I think, ugh, you know, <coughs> I think I'm going to have to go and listen to this, a bunch of different things about the new standards. This was, this was hey, we're going to do this, go where you want, vote with your feet, if something's too, if something's not, if something's too easy for you, get up and leave. If something's too hard for you, get up and leave. Nobody will be offended. We told all of our teachers, people are going to be coming and going. And, and so it, it was, I mean, it was, it was one of those things that teachers were like, I just liked having that freedom. I liked having the freedom to go places and to see things that I, that I liked and see things that I didn't like and, and talk about. It. And, you know, we set up, we had tables like this with the fancy skirts and everything and throw some, we threw some Chromebooks on the table so people could play with stuff. We had, um, we had, some, there was a uh, Makey Makey, there, there was a video game people were playing with that they had made and, and some things like that. So there was just, it was meant to be a playful day with, with learning in it, which the fact that those two things aren't always contiguous, I don't understand, but um, that, that was the idea, was that people should go ahead and play with this stuff. See if it works, if it doesn't, you know, go someplace else. Then the, the last thing is to provide constant support. After you have, after you get this level of excitement, this is where, this is where that disillusionment can come in. Those days create huge expectations. If you don't follow up with those days, like I said, we didn't, we followed up okay. I think we could have done it better. And it's mostly my fault, I will say that. Um, but after those days, when you start to get people who are inching their, are dipping their toe in the water. How you support them will determine how well the program goes. And, and this is, there's, there's, I mean, the easiest thing for me to say <coughs> is that you need dedicated staff to do this. So all of you with all of your unlimited public school budgets, 
are going to go get a bunch more people to come in. I'm sure all of you rich public school teachers are going to do all that. Uh, realistically, that would be the best. However, we all know there's limits to this. And, and so in lieu of a dedicated staff member, the, what we're playing with now is the idea of creating teacher mentorship programs. That in every team of teachers, so in our, in our fourth grade team, for example, we've got one person who's really good with technology and also has pre-existing relationships with the other two fourth grade teachers. And, and the idea is we don't know if we're going to be able to provide them with funds yet to do this, but the idea would be Here's a, here's a small stipend. You can be the go-to person. You can then talk to me about things. You can be sort of the liaison between these things. And this allows for constant support in the areas of, of we'll take care of the baseline so that you can go ahead and try something different. You know, it's, it's those things that I want to make sure that access is not your number one reason why you didn't try this. And that's something that tends to happen a lot. Like, this didn't work. The internet went out yesterday. Technology sucks. I'm never using it again. And, and, and you want to you wanna avoid that. Because it's, it's easy to do that. And, and so how you provide that support is really important. And, and so, so, I, so one is if you can get dedicated staff who are specifically um, devoted to um, assisting teachers with technology, awesome. If those, if those people have coding skills, even better. <laughs> um, so, if you, in lieu of that, creating mentorship programs within the faculty, and, and everybody's got people in the faculty who are probably, you probably are thinking in your head, who might be not only gregarious enough, but also tech savvy enough to be that kind of person. We also created, and this is actually before this, but I would say this helps a lot, we created a technology steering committee, which was representatives from every level of not every grade, but every level, so lower school, middle school, upper school, representatives that would come in and be the sounding board for this kind of stuff. What's going on, with, what's, what's happening, what's new, what are people asking about, what do people want, what are, and this is where we assessed our one-to-one -one program, you know, what are we seeing, we, this is the, the group that, that assessed the, the results of our survey on whether or not kids were using laptops or, or iPads, and, um, this allowed for a level of empowerment among the teachers, that, that all the decisions went through, all the major processing decisions in terms of buying and things like that, was it, were at least given to these people beforehand to say, here, this is what we're thinking about. And actually, it did cause us to make some changes in what we were doing. Um, and, and this is my favorite thing about this that I would have never thought of, was that we were originally talking about going one-to-one -one in sixth grade. And a sixth grade teacher in the, in the committee was like, that's a terrible idea. Because it's their first, they're, they're leaving the lower school, and it's the first time they're going into, into having multiple teachers. There's so many transitions going on as well. If you then pack on this on top of it, you could potentially have some trouble. Now, we found, a, I, I, I sort of pushed back a little bit because there's, but there, we found a compromise where we did go into one, but they didn't go home with the kids. Whereas they could still use them in the classroom, but they didn't they then became your responsibility to take home as a seventh grader. It was sort of a new responsibility with each grade. That might not be what your school decides, but I just love the fact that I had to listen to the voice of expertise in the room when it came to sixth graders about what they may or may not need. And so, so having that steering committee was great because it forced me to, to not plow ahead with all my own ideas and actually listen to the voice of, of the teachers who, who were dealing, not just dealing with, you know, because I'm a teacher in the, I'm a teacher in the high school, so I, I don't, I'm not placing myself outside of that, but someone with that expertise within the, within the grade is, is a, a valuable thing. And so providing that support, so you've got, you've got, um, you've got staff, you've got teachers who are, who are leaders. I would say the other advice I would give is to come up with a student committee, uh, especially tech savvy kids uh, who are willing to and interested in being a, um, sort of a genius bar style. I don't know if you've seen schools that are doing this, doing genius bars where kids staff them and help each other and help the teachers out with technology problems. Um, that's a great thing to do. It also gives kids the opportunity to take an active role and be the experts in the room um, about things. And you, you know, when kids get the chance to teach teachers stuff, they love it. Uh, and so uh, starting, a, starting up a genius bar or something like that would be great. 
Um, if you can do it in the same, you know, if there's a way to, to do it as sort of a work study thing, it's even better. Um, that's, that's another option. And then lastly, the, the one group who I've not yet talked about, but who actually do play a big role in this, is parents. Getting them on board provides a lot of help. I, and, and how I did this is I did, a, I did tech, parent technology nights every month for the first year of our roll-up program. Once a month, I'm going to tell you about something your kids are doing. And what that meant was, one, one time it was Google Docs. One time it was Explain Everything. One time it was uh, Evernote. And, what, and it was pretty straightforward. From my standpoint, it was just like me, me going in saying, here's what they're doing, here's what they're using, here's what it looks like when they're not using it. Because parents want to know, like, is, there, is my kid always going to play a game? And I can say, well, this is what it does. And if, if, they're, if, they're, doing, if they're on their iPad and they're doing this, <laughs> then they're probably not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, so it's about, you know, it's about preparing parents for those types of things. Because you know, realistically, the parents are the ones who, you know, they're they're the ones who have the least experience with this, and are the most likely to get pushback when when things aren't going perfectly. So so you have to teach them in a lot of ways what's going on. And and we just did these once a month. And you know, at first it was venting sessions. First month or so, it was parents like, I don't know about this, but but then shortly after that, it became them asking questions. And then I then I get inevitable emails from parents being like, I'm working on this thing at work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a consultant. Um, so uh, so that would be so that that's some some place to go as well. And that's something I think is is the other side. The last thing I'm going to mention, we also did, and I stole this from a guy by the name of Carl Hooker in Austin, Texas. Uh, he he does something every couple of weeks called Happy Hours. Uh, happy hours are um, little hour-long sessions after after class one day in which they just do. We're going to take one thing. We're going to take one tool. I'm going to show you how it works. I'm going to show you some ways to use it. I'm going to give you some time to play with it, and that's it. One hour, one app. That's it. And this was a great way to get some of those teachers who needed that training on board. So those would be the four ways in which you have to provide that constant support. The last thing I want to mention before I open it up, importance of the library. The modern library should be the innovation hub for the building. This is the place, anybody who tells you libraries need to go away, need to go away themselves. Uh, so <laughs> the idea here, <laughs> the idea is libraries can be this place. Yeah, we may not need to have all of these Nonfiction books. Maybe we don't need all the encyclopedias, but we need we need the librarian desperately. We need we need the navigator. There we are. We are living in a time period in which we have more information than we have ever humanly been able to access, and we're throwing kids out there and saying good luck without anything. A good librarian is worth their weight in gold, and, and having that person who can be in there and showing kids how to get this information, how to play with these things. They're the ones who aren't, they aren't the teachers who are trying to plan for the next day. They've got, they've got a little bit more, they've got a, about a thousand, you know, a, a thousand mile view at times. The library itself can be that hub physically. The fact that you don't need those encyclopedias means that you can now have coding groups meeting, meeting in where, where the stack of encyclopedias used to be. You can, you can put in nice little dedicated areas for kids to read a book. Go figure. <laughs> this play, in, in, if you're talking about developing a program of technology, you cannot, you cannot and should not ever forget the librarian's importance. And, and if, you, if you have a good librarian, celebrate them. And, and get them as much training as you can. Because they will be the person who takes every teacher and makes them better. So, that's about it for me, I think. I think I'm about running out of time. Um, um, yeah, two minutes short. So, um, if you have questions, like I said, I've tweeted out all the links as we've gone. Um, if you have any questions, this is my name, this is my email address, this is my Twitter handle. Um, feel free to touch base. I'm going to be at the PLN Plaza at noon, running some speed app sharing, some speed dating uh, with apps at noon. So, if you want to come by and find out some new apps from each other, Feel free to come on by. But if you have questions, I'll be here for a little bit longer. Uh, happy to do so. 
thank you for being attentive and not looking incredibly bored.